Okay, I thought I wouldn't have enough time, but I think I'll have as much as I want. <laughs> and so I made a few slides just to uh, wrap up very fast and go, go, yeah, go a bit faster. Um, I just want to give you more specifics of uh, what I had in mind since the other lectures were a bit, uh, a bit mathematical in general. So what I have in mind is to do some supergravity computation, but in five dimensions. Okay, that's uh, uh, what I have in mind. And in five dimensions, n equals two supergravity, uh, you have the following Lagrangian, where you have the uh, Einstein's, uh, which is scalar, and then you have the sigma are the scalars and vector multiplets, so you have a triplet, uh, tri um, a cubic function here. And then you have the kinetic terms for uh, other scalars. You have U1 gauge fields, F square, but most importantly, you have a chern simons coupling of this form. And then you also have uh, higher derivative terms, it's a bit complicated, they couple to R square. So for example, you have a coupling to the scalar, Riemann tensor, and then you have also, most importantly, you have this chern simons coupling, A wedge trace R wedge R, and then you have like tons of SUSY terms to complete the, the theory. So, what is crucial in this theory in 5D um, that's usually obtained as dimensional reduction of M tier on a Calabiao? So it, most importantly is that the theory is defined by uh, um, essentially two, two type of couplings. One is this uh, three index symmetric tensor, which is this intersection matrix. Omega A's are two cycles, are two forms on the uh, Calabiao. And the other one is the second chern class of tangent bundle. So you have some integral like this. Trace R which R plus some, some stuff. So that's, these two numbers are crucial. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look, uh, so, so there's also an off-shell um, formulation of this theory. And if you look at the off-shell BPS equations, you'll find that the metric can be of this type. So I, I've told you in the beginning that there's like a family of solutions, but I'll be looking at one extreme one where you have a locally ADS3 factor, some ADS2 times S1, and that is a two sphere there. When you write this in the coordinates that we've seen in all the lectures, so this is the Euclidean uh, metric. You have ADS2 factor here, this is Euclidean time. And then you have the circle fibered over the ADS2. So this is lives, this uh, component lives on the ADS2. And there's one parameter, phi naught here in this metric. Okay. So if you take uh, different coordinates, just call it y prime equals y over phi naught. So basically you can put this inside. This cut appears, it becomes the y prime. So the metric, uh, uh, loses dependence on phi naught, disappears. That means that this metric is a quotient, roughly speaking, so some ADS3 quotient, uh, by some group gamma, which you, and, and you can say that this group has an order, order the, of the group, is infinite dimensional, but you can roughly say that order of the group is this phi naught. There's some basics. Um, so moreover, the U1 gauge fields are, so they have this component on the sphere, so the Dirac uh, gauge field, okay? It's not well-defined, but the flux is well-defined. PA is a magnetic charge. And the component that lives on ADS times S1 is flat, just dy, and this is a constant. So you have another scalar phi A, and I wrote uh, as a ratio because, as you'll see in a moment, and then you have the scalars, the vector multiplets that obey this condition that L, the size of ADS times the sigma. So sigma has dimensions of mass. So P is the dimensionless, is an integer. Yeah, it has magnetic charge, so it's constant. And so all the remaining fields are covariantly constant. Okay, you have many more, so I'm not gonna describe, but these are the most important. So what we obtain under dimensional reduction to the 4D, is the usual closed kind reduction. You get uh, ADS times this two metric with equal sizes, and a KK gauge field, which has this form. <coughs> the, 
than the other U1 gauge fields, uh, what do you do? You usual trick, you put here the component, which is a closed client gauge field, and then subtract. So this should be phi A, sorry. So th this thing's cut, get phi A, and then minus phi A. So it's the same gauge field as above. And this is the PA, the, the direct gauge field. So this part here is the four dimensional gauge field. Okay. And this thing will become a new scalar field in 4D, which will join the sigma A. So there'll be one more uh, scalar field. Oh. What is that scalar field? So basically, uh, <clears throat> phi A is the real of XA times L. So XA is the scale L minus 1 phi A plus I sigma A. It's a complex uh, uh, scalar field, and it belongs to the vector multiplet. Casual reduction. Um. So another thing is that, um, so when you're just to four dimensions, because of supersymmetry, the couplings are actually determined by prepotential, as we have learned from uh, um, Stefan Samir's talk, and so on. And in this case, the potential is just uh, this cubic potential, CABC, XA, XBXC. In the two derivative case, okay, just, just, to, just to simplify. So what are the, is essentially the degrees of freedom? In 5D, you have um, <clears throat> this phi A, phi naught, and PAs that will parameterize the solution. These are constants. You give me this constants, you give, that's the solution. In 4D, on the other hand, as we have learned, you have electric charge and, and, and magnetic charges. And all the scalar fields become functions of those charges. Right, all the scalar fields become functions of, of the charges. <coughs> so either you uh, work with the phi's and p's, or you work with the q's and p's. It's the same. You obtain the same solutions in 5D and, and 4D. Okay, so this was uh, the basics of just uh, the background in 5D. But I'm interested in a 3D point of view. I just wanna look to the ADS2 times S1 part. Okay, I wanna focus on that. So if I reduce on a two sphere, what I obtain, what I obtain, and not exactly obtain, is actually, actually is like a truncation. In that truncation you have the usual uh, Ricci scalar with a negative cosmological constant. And <clears throat> you'll obtain a bunch of um, U1 churn simons and DAB, you can call it the matrix of the levels of the couplings of the churn simons And then if I uh, further gauge the isometers of the sphere, as you well know, there's some SU2 uh, type of isometries, then you get this churn simons SU2 churn simons with some level K, okay? So I, I, I didn't care about these coefficients here, I will care later, but that's the, the picture. And, uh, <clears throat> and so you could have asked, what are the scalars, sigma A? Okay, I just, I just kept the metric and the gauge fields. What are the scalars? The scalars are the magnetic charges, roughly speaking. The magnetic charges <coughs> appear in these matrices. So this PC is basically the sigma A. So you give me that scalar field and it reminds me all the couplings of these churn simons in this way. So this will be linear in P, this will be cubic in P, the, the, the S2 churn simons. So it is to check that the 5D solution is a solution of this 3D action, okay? Everything is flat, flat connections, constants. AD is on this one as negative uh, uh, curvature. This is to check that. Uh, <clears throat> and so, some comment about ADS352. So basically, this truncation is keeping just the metric uh, field. The U1 gauge fields is some SE2 uh, connection. 
so that, that, that keeping those fields very corresponds looking to the sector of the theory where you have the stress tensor, the U1 currents, S2 currents, affine currents. And you know that all these uh, tensors, they have a certain uh, anomaly coefficients. So the stress tensor is some central charge, and the U1 currents are some uh, level K, and the same thing for the SU2. And so all these parameters K uh, here and C correspond precisely to the um, levels of the churn simons that I, I mentioned before. So churn, churn simons, yeah? So conceptually, just because as I understand, I have to put you what you're discussing in parallel to what uh, Samir discussed. Yeah. However, in this case, it was just ADS2 and there was underlying CFT1. Yeah. But you have the CFT2 here. Yeah, this, I think this picture will be more like uh, the uh, Zaffaroni picture. You have a UV, picture, UV point of view, and you do the computation like in UV, and to get the ADS2. But uh, yeah, that's roughly the idea. So these levels, change some of is mapped to levels of the affine current algebras. And basically, uh, the levels of these current algebras are the indices that appear, the Jacobi forms that I described. Okay, that's the coefficients. So can you describe the CFT, the CFT to a little bit? What, what I always have in mind is, is the MSW CFT. Who's M? Oh, it's model sin, astrometer, Witten. Okay, that's the, the more general. Uh, it, so it's like an M5 rain uh, wrapping some divisor oh. E. So it's a complicated theory, but you can also consider the D1, D5 system. There's like has a more supersymmetry 4,4. Okay. But here, since I'm talking about five dimensions, like M theory, we should be looking to the MSW in particular. The M theory. Sorry, I'm yeah. 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 I'm just going to show that. This, this is the slow part. <laughs> so the thing is that you can write the three uh, gravitational parts of this theory in terms of uh, churn simons couplings. But this result, uh, it's only valid at the level of the equation of motion on shell. So I'm not sure if people have been able to prove that this also holds quantum mechanically, but okay, I'm, I'm gonna skip that detail. But this thing is equal to that on shell. And basically you can go from the metric formulation to the connections formulation. And the churn summons level of this, uh, the churn summons level is related to the central charge in the following way, L over G, G is Newton's constant. And L is the size of ADS, okay, usual, uh, usual thing. And <coughs> if you pick um, ADS2 times S1 with um, Lorentzian signat signature, sorry, if you pick ADS3 with Lorentzian signature, then you have um, connections valid in SL2R, so they're real. And the uh, other uh, components valid in SL2R, right. So that, that's the SL2,2. In the Euclidean case, they are actually a complex conjugate to each other. So AL is an SL2C, because now you get SL1,3. Okay. So everything I'll do is Euclidean. So there are SL2C uh, connections. And that was the fast introduction that I want to do. Oh, sorry because, and I'll leave this, because leave this for the N equals A theory, so Samir mentioned a bit briefly. Um, <coughs> so I remember, remember that the, for N equals eight, I have um, in one of my slides yesterday, I have this uh, Jacobi form. So is this index equals one, and that means that many things simplify, I get just one polar term, and I get uh, this answer, which is exact. And I'll just leave it here. Okay. I'll
Five and five. Oh, oh, this five two, five minus two one. So it's, it's one of the generators of the ring. So it's something like. Uh, no, 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 not the expression. But what is that for the CSP? Sorry. Oh, for the super graph for the ADS CSP theory. Yeah. Where you need yes. Come from in relation to the previous transparency. It, it is not a lytic genus. Uh, it's, it's this. This lytic genus. Oh, this is a sigma model. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, it's not zero weights. So, yeah. For the moment, is not yet. So, uh, what is the um, the uh, main idea? Is that uh, I'll be trying to compute some partition function. Well, 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 be, we we have been all trying this cool computing some z gravity, uh, and I will describe partially uh, this computation for the this background a d s two times s one, and I will claim that. Um, so besides the ADS solutions that Samir uh, referred, uh, that oh, I will try to explain that there are additional orbifolds of this type in the path integral, say that C. And the computation I will perform, I'll just compute this action at the on-shell level. At the on-shell level. <coughs> And I'll show this corresponds to the uh, churn summons action of a flat connection. And I will comment that there is also, you can compute some determinant here from this churn summons, a one loop determinant. And basically, you'll get um, a dependence on these levels. So there are many levels. Uh, there, are the, there are SO2 levels, there are the U1 levels, and there are SO2 levels. And you basically get some dependence like this. And if you remember our, my lecture yesterday, I mentioned some uh, cohomology like this thing. So there's some dimension of uh, some cohomology. And this you can also. Uh, relates to uh, some cohomology on ADS2, roughly speaking. This? 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 No, I'm just saying I'll try to compute the Z gravity for this background, and I'll get what I get. No, no, I'll just compute at the on-shell level first. Okay. And then if you want to get yeah, compute the localization. The localization will give me the other order corrections. So this will be like proportional to level k. And the localization should give me the other corrections in k, <coughs> exact corrections. Something like that. But I'll just do this before it works. This is always assumed as our k. Huh? Yeah, in a sense, yeah. Um, okay, so I think that if you do the co-communication, should it just combine that chain? Yeah, yes. Oh, right. my, my, my goal is really to make the connection to the churn simons uh, point of view, okay? That's uh, my main focus. And you'll see what I get, okay? Uh, okay, so I should erase this, sorry. So yesterday, uh, I talked about the solid torus and the filling of the torus inside the solid torus. So as you know, uh, um, as you know, there is a class of ADS3 solutions in 3D, right? So there is no propagating degrees of freedom. So all the solutions are of the type ADS3 and then a quotient on that space. 
So one usually starts with a global ADS3. That you well know. Now, in the global ADS3, this has a, a, this Euclidean time is like a circle, but for the purpose of taking quotients, you have to take uh, this time direction to extend it to infinity, and then usually theta to pi, okay, eta from zero to infinity, <coughs> and so on. And as you can easily see, this is a uh, this is a line. So basically, you have the topology of a line times a disk. So this disk here is basically an ADS2 part. <clears throat> so then the idea is that you can identify points on this um, line, and then you get the solid torus. So all these ADS3, I'll just uh, explain better. Model gamma have the topology of uh, solid torus, S1 times D. So how does the, this, this thing works? So if you pick this space, you have a cylinder at infinity. So this is Euclidean time. This is theta, right? So what you do, you can, for example, identify this point with this point here. Then what you get is the usual torus, right? Some tau. Um, Still <clears throat> two, but you can also identify this point here with this point here, this point, this point here, and so on. And now there's some aperture here. It's called tau one. So basically, generate a torus with complex structure, what you already know. Right. So basically, we identify tau e, Euclidean time plus two pi to two, so pi tau one. That's this red one. And then you still have a circle, right, identification. So you still have this identification. So what do we have you, then with this identification? What you get is some prime ADS3. But whose boundary is this T2 with a complex structure tau? Okay, that is called a thermal ADS3. Instead of writing the cylinder like this, this identification, so you have a torus uh, at the boundary. So I can just uh, write, describe the torus in terms of a lattice, like this. And this is like uh, the theta direction, roughly. And this is uh, tau. And identify all points this way, right? And then this with this point, and you get a torus with this complex structure. So you, we have, we have, um, now we have this z, right? Z 
C. So identification with Z, Z plus two pi tau, right? This point, this point, this point. And you also have identification on this direction. There's some two pi's here, so sorry. Um, <clears throat> so this cycle here, so this, sorry, this Z gets the theta plus I T uh, Euclidean. So once you do this uh, identification here, uh, this cycle here will be uh, the non-contractible cycle. And this is the contractible. Well, it's easy to see because, so this Z is basically uh, this theta to two pi. So this was uh, on the disk. So you had the metric. You had something like a sine of square eta So theta was parameterized in the disk angle, so it's contractible. And then because this z, this tau, has a component along the Euclidean time, goes along the Euclidean time, then is in the non-contractible cycle. But this is the lattice. Nobody tells you to choose this particular basis. So there's some basis I, I've chosen here. I could have picked this basis too. Or whatever you want, you could pick some other basis here and so on. So there are many bases you could, could pick. And you still generate the same torus, the same lattice, the same torus. So there is a, uh, there is a cell to Z matrix uh, so to Z, uh, value of choices you can make. So this is like uh, some basis for some identifications. And, and this matrix has to be integer and with determinant one, such that every, every two bases is primitive. There's only one point inside the cell. In this new basis, if you try to compute this periodicities, these identifications, what you get is just, just A, B, C, D. One periodicity was tau, right? Tau. And the other is one. So what you get is A tau plus B, C tau plus D. So this is the new periodicities of this lattice. But because <coughs> the ADS3 metric uh, at infinity has this conformal factor, factor that I want to get rid of, I can always uh, do a conformal transformation, Z, Z, C tau plus D, such that this becomes tau plus D plus D. Okay, sorry for being a bit fast, but this is like a standard um, story, the family of um, ADS3 solutions. So, <clears throat> so when you choose different bases, what you obtain is the, a new ADS3 prime. So there's some, with the boundary of torus, T2, but now the complex structure is this one. Tau prime, tau plus B, C tau plus Z. So you started with uh, ADS3, which had a torus with complex structure tau. And then you do, did a change of basis, A, B, C, D. And then you did the conformal transformation, Z, C tau plus D, to bring this to one like fixing uh, some, some volume. And then you get a new torus with this complex structure, A tau plus B, C tau plus D. So why I'm doing all this? Because with this solution, ADS3, 
I'll be able to generate solutions for uh, ADS2 times S1. <coughs> Another way of seeing uh, this construction, and it'll be important uh, this lecture, is that you can see the hyperbolic space. So there is an equation for the hyperbolic space, right? And you can write it in terms of, um, so basically hyperbolic space, space, so Euclidean, is basically the set of points for which the determinant of this matrix which the determinant of this matrix equals one. And these are the points on the hyperbola space. That's the definition. So if you call this, this matrix X, so you want the determinant of X equals one. Then this thing is our mission, right? see. So it's easy to see what type of isometries this space has. So any, any, um, any configuration, any um, new matrix like this with G cell to C. If we just multiply by G, X, G, uh, dagger, this X prime still has determinant one, okay? That's how we determine the isometries of uh, the space. X prime. <coughs> and so in, like uh, when you study, for example, um, find some of the quotients of, some of the quotients of a three sphere, what you do is write the three sphere in that form. You have some SC2 times SC2 uh, worth of isometries. And then you have to include the, this quotient at one in this, uh, in this uh, group. And you identify uh, points uh, according to this uh, um, quotient here. So for ADS3, it's the same thing, same construction. ADS3, uh, very similar. So I have some x, and I identify axes <coughs> uh, with the, this matrix. Five uh, points like this, and then you generate um, the uh, solutions to the term, the thermal ADS3. So this will be like thermal ADS3. And then if you do, if instead of putting tau, you put uh, this thing here. So tau plus d, tau, d, tau. Uh, and the same thing here, tau plus d, c tau bar plus d. If you do this identification, then you get uh, the solution here. Okay, that's the space that you get. And then you can read the coordinates, build a metric, 
And then what you'll find is that uh, when c is bigger or equal than 1, so you do this, this identification, it put on the metric. When c bigger than 1, <coughs> all the solutions are uh, BTZ black holes. So they have some horizon. This is the usual family of black holes solutions. Another important thing is that uh, <coughs> if uh, C1 was your uh, non-contractible cycle, and C2 was the contractible cycle. So to remind you, is this, this cycle here? Pi tau, so Z, Z close to pi. When you choose a different basis, then the new contractible and non-contractible cycles are just a relabeling of that. So <clears throat> the non-contractible cycle, cycle becomes now A C1 plus B C2. And the contractible cycle becomes C C1 plus D C2. So this is nothing more than what I explained yesterday. And the solitors, you can fill the solitors with different homology by defining which cycle becomes contractible or not in the full geometry. It becomes contractible because you put a solid disk inside the problem. Exactly, yeah. Because for this ADS3, it's always a solitors uh, topology. Exactly. OK. Uh, So one thing that I will not be able to explain in full detail, uh, but I recommend reading uh, Samir's paper and Boris Pilin. So you can, out of these solutions, you can generate um, extremal BTZ solutions. And when you do that, you will generate uh, the following uh, solutions, which are of the type ADS2 times S1. So there's a particular limit of the solutions. It's like an extremal limit. And you obtain it is two times S1 solutions. That I'll write. So we have the usual size, the same story. It's one, it is two parts. R square plus. So, and then the most important factor <coughs> is that um, <coughs> what you obtain is that actually this theta will have a periodicity, which is a fractional a fraction of 2 pi. So that's the C that appears uh, in this matrix. And then there will be a component here which depends on the D. OK, not to confuse with the D theta. This D and C are the same from this matrix. So you have, uh, so basically what you obtain is nothing else than a quotient of AD times S1 mod ZC. So identify points on the disk by 2 pi c. And to keep the solution smooth, because there's a fixed point at the origin, you shift the y coordinate by some integer d, such that d and c are co-prime. 
So everything that I described so far is just for you to generate this type of solutions. And I'll call this M of C and D. So the, analo the analogy in compact space, you have uh, S1 times S2 sphere. And then you can take quotients of this, ZC, and what you obtain of the land space, C and D. That's the analog. OK, I have to speed up. OK, any questions so far? So there are two things here um, which are important. One is a metric that you obtain. But the metric on RDS ADS3 is completely determined by the contractual cycle. And so you only see C and D appearing in the metric, OK? All, all depends explicitly on C and D. But there's also a topology, the homology change, which cycle becomes contractible or not. So there's two aspects which are important. Um, <clears throat> Now the thing is that, uh, so I, in that slide I've shown you uh, a gravitational picture where you have um, Einstein's action, and then there is some uh, Chern-Simons formulation. Like this. So basically here you have a metric, and here you have connections, or better, you have these al alonomies of these connections. And so here, the metric is roughly is ADS3, right? And these connections, they live on the solid torus. So yeah, it's complex. Yeah, it's only real in the Lorentzian signature. It's because of churn Simons, actually. So here one has the metric formulation. Here one has the solid torus and has connections. So all the information about uh, uh, the geometry itself, the complex structure of the torus, so there's some boundary ADS3, T2, some complex tau. All this information becomes encoded in this alonomies. So it's a different thing. So the alonomies will know about this complex structure, and they live on solid torus. OK, let's get practical. Um, I'll keep this metric. So one exercise I want to do was to compute the uh, on-shell action um, of uh, this theory on this metric. Yeah? Sorry, sorry. The, the metric is imaginary. So what, that I took, I wanted to do two computations. I'm not sure if I'll have time. One was to compute the on-shell action action of this with the metric. Yeah. There's some orientation thing that because of Chen Simons. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what I want to do is that when you have this uh, 3D action, you can try to read this on the circle and you get uh, some years exercise in the first lecture because everything ADS2. And you can, can, can try to compute uh, a la sen, the renormalized action. That's one exercise. So basically you reduce, this is 3D. So 3D to 2D. Right, and then you have some R2, some F square that comes from the closed client gauge field. And what you obtain from here, <coughs> it's that. So how much time do I have left? I know I have a lot, but. 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. So I'll just, um, I will uh, sketch this computation because it's, it's very um, useful to learn. So you have, when you go from 3D to 2D, uh, so you, ha you have this action, 16 pi G. Over L square. And then you reduce the, the rich scalar, becomes rich scalar in two dimensions. And then you get, so here I'll write this in a different way. So, just to keep the conventions of my slides. I'll do that. And then just have it to the uh, Einstein plus Maxwell, and I'll even as an exercise to compute the renormalized action of, of this of this uh, of this theory, and compare with the uh, with the Samir's uh, computation. But uh, this F, so the gauge field, the closed client gauge field, is this thing here. Now you understand the uh, Michele. Now we understand the I. This is the Euclidean, okay? When you go to two dimensions, and as Samir has explained, this is this is non-normalizable, and you have to fix if it's electric field. So we need to add to this theory in two dimensions, we need to add the whistle line part with some coefficient here, which is determined by phi naught. You have the whistle line, you compute the renormalized action. So, um, <coughs> so on shell 3D plus boundary term equals, equals this thing. <coughs> I'm not gonna. Keep all, all these terms, and you obtain um, central charge. I'll just, just explain so central charge divided by six pi over c. Not i okay, so c c bigger. Okay, sorry, I put white. Uh, central charge. So it's not to be confused with this C. This C here is the C of this quotient, right? There's some quotient here. So the C minus oh sorry, yeah. Like this. C, and this thing, what I call central charge, uh, equals uh, 
is the central charge of uh, Brown and O, okay? Three, o two, L over G, or two thirds. Okay, you get this central charge here. And you get, well, you get one part which is real, the action, and this part here is, uh, is a phase, is imaginary. And everything is, is, is divided by C because of the quotient, okay? You're computing some integral on that quotient, you get one over C, and this is a phase. And if you use the attractor mechanism, and on ADS2, you can write this in terms of charges, of Q and P charges. And so this term becomes just S black hole. That's a mere computer. But the real, the, the, um, what I really wanted to do, uh, I'll try to explain now. So instead of using the metric formulation, I want to use the churn simons formulation. So in the churn simons formulation, uh, this action contains the following factors. This. Don't be, don't be confused with Chen Simon, it's just equivalent. Yeah, I'll just show you. So this exercise was just to um, show you that uh, you can use the the the, um, the techniques that Samir explained for the quantum entropy. The same rules apply here for ADS2. You have to do this Mosa line and get the entropy. Okay. And then the churn Simon formulation is slightly different because you have to compute this on a solid torus, like what I the way I explained yesterday. And those things should be the same. So there is an odd problem also, right? That there are some configurations that are singular as metrics, but not as connections. Uh, what do you mean? So this is SU2. But everything is on shell. I'm not talk talking about connections which vanish, and so there's no metric. No, it's not the case. It's like the microcanonical point of view. If I was in a canonical, yeah, that would be like, you have to sum over different connections. And you should include those which doesn't have a metric formulation. But here's just a mapping, okay? I map the gravitational metric to the churn simons. So the full quantum entropy, uh, this won't be enough because you'll have to introduce matter in the theory. You know that if I have this gravity, it's not Chen, Chen Simons. It's like the topological sector of the theory. And then you have massive fields, like closed decline modes, and so on. So if you do that, then you'll be reproducing the full answer. <coughs> so I just want to put into practice the things that I explained yesterday to compute um, this Chen Simons action. And so yesterday, at the end, I've showed you that this integral for a flat connection, for a flat connection, 
on oscillators was two pi square alpha beta, where beta um, <coughs> was the whistle line along the non-contractible cycle. And this was the whistle line of A on the contractible cycle. It's very simple. So basically all these churn assignments here will be of the same form. Alpha times beta for each uh, SL2, SL2R, and SC2. Because I don't have so much time, I'll tell you uh, what are the um, uh, Wilson lines for all these gauge fields. Um, put here. So for example, for this A left on the uh, non-contractible cycle, you have the following function. Then you have a left on the contractible cycle. So contractible. And then for the SL2R, now this one is much simpler, it's just A over C. So uh, why this A is PCD? Because I'm computing this on the, um, so I'm computing these integrals on this, on the solid terms, which is obtained by then filling, okay? That I explain, explained yesterday, ABCD filling. So when you compute uh, these allonomies, you have to compute over the non-contract of a cycle, which is something like AC1 plus BC2, and the contractible cycles C, C1 plus D, C2. And you get these values. And um, you, could have, you could have asked, how do I get these connections? Well, you have to write the metric in terms of the connections and then, then do the integrals, okay? That's very complicated. But uh, as I um, um, described before, when you look at uh, ADS3, as a quotient, basically uh, the element of identification becomes the allonomy of the connections, and you can read these components. It's very easy. Once I give you this this quotient, easy to it's easy to extract uh, this this these uh, intervals here. I forgot here one thing. So there's a similar, there's also for the SU2 connection that I forgot to write, sorry. on the contractible cycle, tilde, or two. These are the whistle lines. And then besides this, these are bulk terms. And besides the bulk terms, you have to add uh, boundary terms on the T2, which are the form uh, A1 times A2. So this uh, A1 and A2 are flat connections on a T2, 
on a particular basis. So basically A1, just the integral of A around C1, and A2, integral of A around C2, where, um, <clears throat> so A C1 plus B C2 is this non-contractible cycle. Just to remind you, and then C C1 plus D C2 is the contractible cycle. Okay, <clears throat> that's some basis. And you have to, do, to add this because <clears throat> you, are, you are in turn Simon's theory, you can either fix one component or the other, so you have the choice. And to do that choice, you have to add a, a particular boundary term. In this case, I'm keeping this fixed, and this is not fixed. If you reduce to two dimensions, you get precisely uh, Ashok's argument that electric fields are fixed and the, non, and the, the chemical potential must, must fluctuate. That's precisely this, this uh, that's what this boundary term does. And then you have to add this for, so there's a trace here, and you have to add this for any uh, element of the gauge, any uh, factor of the gauge group. minutes sorry yeah I'll just uh, wrap up I start at 12 right okay <laughs> some speakers had like 70 or okay. uh, five minutes so so when you compute the part of the churn Simons I'll put just churn Simons bulk you get minus two pi i k over four l plus d. Then the part of the churn simons action, this boundary term, you get two pi i or tau c square. And then you also get, um, sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. When you put everything together, you get to the total. The total, this plus this, after some algebra. And when you write it in terms of the, um, not in terms of C tau plus D, but in terms of, um, so this becomes I over phi naught in the other variables of the metric, then you obtain that result and what is that result so the final action it's so there are two phases minus 2 pi i k over 4 k over c plus 2 pi i k over 4 The real part you can check is S black hole. So after all this computation, you get uh, S black hole plus phases. And when you plug back 
uh, the, in terms of values of the charges, that you can use the entropy function to determine this phi naught. It's for k minus l square. Okay. So when you do that, so everything is well explained here. So sorry for going a bit fast. So when you do that, you get my final formula. this, and then for the n equals a theory, k is the level of the chern simons n is 1. So you plug in this formula, then you check this. So you look at the Hadamard expansion, uh, including the Kusterman sums. So if you take the uh, subtle point approximation of this formula here, including the Kusterman sum. So the Kusterman sum has these phases, and it has this multiplier matrix. So you take that value on shell, so the Bessel function becomes this exponential here. And then basically you have a sum over C, goes from one to infinity, with these conditions, with that exponential times the multiplier matrix. So that's precisely uh, this action I computed very fast, up to this multiplier matrix. And for that, you need to have uh, more structure, like some more churn simons, couplings to compute it in detail. It's in our paper, but I, I didn't have time to go, to go into that. So that I finish. Okay, thank you.